Hi, my name is Greg, and I'm an academic coach here at SNHU. Welcome to this guide on rational functions. In this video in particular, we're going to go over what makes a rational function and how does it look when you graph it. So what is a rational function? Um, rational means fractional. So think of it as a equation in which the variable is in the denominator of a fraction. So here's an example. And I wrote f of x because that's function notation. If you've seen it written as just y equals 1 over x minus 2, that mean essentially the same thing. <clears throat> so why does it look, um, or what does it look like when we graph it? Well, what you can always resort to whenever you encounter, whenever you encounter a, uh, an equation in which you're not familiar with what it would look like when you graph it, you can always, always, always resort to a t-table. And a t-table is just, you're going to create some points that you get to plot, and we'll connect the dots and see what kind of shape that it makes. So I'm going to plug in these x values. I just made these x values up. I like to plug in negative numbers up through some positive numbers. And I'm going to calculate what their corresponding y value is. I will plot their dots, their points on the graph, and see if I can figure out what kind of shape it's making. So I'm going to plug in the number negative 2. So instead of 1 over x minus 2, it's 1 over negative 2 minus 2. I replaced x with this number. And you get 1 over negative 4, which is a negative 1 fourth. So I'm going to plot that on the graph over here to the right, that little red rectangle. And I'm just going to keep going until I can figure out, well, what kind of pattern am I noticing? So I'll plug in a negative 1. And you can see we'll get a negative 1 third. And I'll plot that point as well. So feel free to pause this video and try it on your own. I'm going to plug in 0. I'll get a negative 1 half. Again, I'll plot that. I'll plug in a 1. I'll get 1 over negative 1, which is just negative 1. So we finally got a whole number or an integer. And you can see that it's starting to decline. So I'm starting to get an idea of the pattern. But now that I plug in 2, I'll have 1 over 2 minus 2. 2 minus 2 is 0, and 1 over 0, you can't do it. You can't have 0 in the denominator of a fraction. Go ahead and try it on your calculator, and it'll give you some error message. So we call that undefined. So what does that mean? How do I graph undefined on a coordinate plane like this? So we'll look into that in a minute. But let's keep going. Let's see, you know, what happens when we plug in the 3. So I'm going to plug in 3. I'll have 1 over 1, which is now 1. So suddenly, we've jumped up above the x-axis, and now we've got some positive numbers going on. And if I plug in 4, I get a half. So what I did is I went over to Desmos. Desmos.com is a wonderful free online website that you can use as a graphing calculator. And you can type in this equation f of x equals 1 over x minus 2, and it'll graph it for you. And here's the graph that I got. So you can see the points that we were creating are right there, right on the graph. But maybe we want to figure out, well, why does it look like this? We can see what it, it did as we plugged in points. Why? So let's look into that. If you noticed, it looks like it's been cut into two pieces. So the reason it looks like it's been cut into two pieces, which is a characteristic of a rational function when there's a variable in the denominator of the fraction, <clears throat> is called asymptote lines. An asymptote is an imaginary line uh, that a graph approaches as it continues in a certain direction. So there's essentially three types of asymptote lines, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and then there's something called oblique or slant asymptotes. And for our purposes today, we're not going to go into the oblique, but we will definitely talk about the vertical and the horizontal. So what's a vertical asymptote? How would we find such a thing? Well, it's the x value that can't be plugged into the function because it makes the denominator equal to 0. Well, we did that, didn't we? We plugged in the number 2, and it didn't work. So at x equals 2, we can draw this vertical line. This is our first vertical asymptote. And you can see it perfectly cuts this graph into two different pieces. Then there's also something called a horizontal asymptote. And it's the y value that the graph is approaching if you continue to graph it in either the positive or negative direction. And I'm going to discuss a couple ways we can calculate where that is. 
and the most common or simplest way I think to determine where the horizontal asymptote is, is you can just plug in a really big or really small number. And when I say small number, I mean a big negative number. So I could plug in a really big number like a thousand or a really small number like a negative 1000. That would be a small number. The bigger the number is in the negative direction, the smaller it is. And whatever answer you get should be a good approximation of where the horizontal asymptote is. So let's try that. So I took this equation, one over x minus two, and I replaced x with just a thousand. Again, I'm plugging a really big number. You can see I'm gonna get one over 998. If you divide that on your calculator, you'll get 0 0.001, which is approximately zero. So that's where our horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. And you can see that sure does look like it's cutting this graph horizontally. So we have this graph being cut vertically by the vertical asymptote. And it looks like it's kind of cut horizontally with the horizontal asymptote. So there's another way we can calculate this horizontal asymptote instead of just plugging a really big or really small number. It's a little more complicated, um, but it's more algebraic. It'll give you more exact answers than this approximation when we get decimals. And it's where we can compare the degree. The degree is the highest exponent on the variable in the expression. We can compare the degree of the numerator versus the denominator. And three things could happen. So let's go over those three things. The first thing that could happen is the degree is higher in the bottom, in the denominator. And if that's true, then there'll be a horizontal asymptote at zero. So here's an example. I've come up with this new function or equation, f of x equals 2x over x squared plus 3x. So if I look at the degree in the numerator, there's only one x, and it's not being squared or cubed or raised to any other power. So there's an imaginary one there as an exponent saying there's one x here. And in the denominator, we have a two for its degree. So there's uh, an x squared plus a three x. We take the highest exponent on either of those two terms, and we assign that as the degree of that entire denominator. So we have a degree of two in the denominator, which is bigger than what's in the numerator. So there'll be a horizontal asymptote at zero. And that's what we had in our example as well. If you look over here to our original equation, f of x equals one over x minus two, the degree in the numerator is zero. And we say that because there is no variable up there. So we say its degree is zero. And in the bottom, the degree is one because there is one x down there. So again, that would say that our denominator has a higher degree than the numerator. So we should have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, which again, we did. Another thing that could happen is if the degree is higher in the numerator instead. And if it is, there won't be a horizontal asymptote. So here's another example. And you can see the degree in the numerator would be three and the degree in the denominator would be one. So since the degree is higher in the numerator, there won't be any horizontal asymptote at all. And hopefully this makes a little more sense if you plug in a really big number. So imagine plugging in a thousand into this equation. Well, when you plug in that thousand in the numerator, you're gonna cube that thousand and you're gonna square that thousand. So these numbers are gonna get really big, but in the denominator, all you're doing is taking a thousand and subtracting five from it. So you can see that the numerator is going to become really, really big, and the denominator isn't. So that's why the bigger the numbers I plug in, the bigger the answer turns out to be. So there is no limit. There is no horizontal asymptote. And the third thing that can happen is we could have the same degree in the numerator and the denominator. They could be exactly the same. And if that's true, then the horizontal asymptote will be where the co leading coefficients reduce. So we'll just take the leading coefficients and reduce them. So for this example, I have y equals 2x plus 6 over 3x minus 5. They have the exact same degree. Again, as a refresher, the degree in the numerator would be 1 because there is only, only 1x up there. It's not being squared or cubed or anything. And then the denominator also has just a degree of 1. So all we have to do is take the leading coefficients, whatever the numbers are in front of the variable that has the highest degree, we just reduce them. So we would just get two thirds. So y equals two thirds would be our horizontal asymptote. 
And again, this should make sense if you plug in a really big number. Imagine plugging in a million. Well, in the numerator, you'd have basically 2 million, just over 2 million, 2 million six. And in the denominator, you'd have just under 3 million. So you'd basically have 2 million over 3 million. Yeah, that would reduce to 2 thirds. All right, so your turn. So feel free to pause this video and attempt to graph this function on your own. And if you want some steps to follow, here are my suggestions of steps to do in a certain order. So I would say find the vertical asymptote or totes. There could be multiple of them. Again, we're looking for numbers that make the denominator equal to zero. Find any horizontal asymptotes, if there are any, because again, I told you that it is possible there aren't any if the degree in the numerator is higher than the denominator. And then plot some points to get an idea of where this graph is located. So again, feel free to pause the video and try it on your own. I'll go ahead and start finding some of these pieces of information. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the vertical asymptote. And again, it's any number that would make the denominator equal to zero. And if you notice, I have two parentheses down there. And we like it. This is called factored. It's in its factored form. And we like that because it's easier to figure out, oh, what numbers would make the denominator equal to zero? And if you look at the first parentheses, what number could I plug in to make this entire parentheses equal to zero? Well, that'd be one. And even though it doesn't make the second parentheses equal to one, it doesn't matter because if what's in the first parentheses is zero, right? If I plug in one, I'll have one minus one, which is zero. Then zero times whatever's in the second parentheses is still gonna be zero. So that's one of our vertical asymptotes, but there's a different number that would make the second parentheses equal to zero. And that would be negative three. So if I plot these, these are my two vertical asymptotes. So now my graph is basically going to be cut into three pieces, something to the left of the first vertical asymptote. There's going to be a graph in the middle of these two asymptotes. And there's going to be a graph to the right of this last asymptote. So now let's look for a horizontal asymptote. And it might make sense with the denominator being factored, it might make sense to go ahead and multiply those two binomials together if you think that's easier. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and do what they call FOIL. I'm going to multiply these two bin binomials together. So feel free to do that on your own. And again, pause the video. And if you do that, this is what you'll get. I'll get x squared plus 2x minus 3. And now if I look at the degrees, they have the exact same degree. It's an x squared on the top and an x squared on the bottom. So again, all we're going to do is reduce their coefficients. If you look, when there's not a number in front of a term, there's an imaginary one there saying I, ha I have one of these. So if I divide those two, right, two divided by one, I'll just get two. So that's where our horizontal asymptote is. So now that I've found all my boundary lines, essentially, now I'm just going to make a t-table and I'm going to plug in some numbers. You can plug in as many numbers as you want. The more numbers you plug in, the more precise your graph will turn out to be. I typically plug in at least one point in each region, one point to the left of the vertical asymptote, one point in the middle, and then one point to the right of the last asymptote. But again, the more the merrier. So let's say I plug in negative four. That's to the left of negative three. And I'll show you what it would look like. So instead of 2x squared in the numerator, it'll be 2 times negative 4 squared. And in the bottom, instead of x minus 1, it'll be negative 4 minus 1. And instead of x plus 3, it'll be negative 4 plus 3. So I did the calculations. I got 32 over 5, which will be about 6.2. So go ahead on your own and plug in 0 and 2. And again, feel free to plug in any additional numbers you want. Again, it's only going to help you make a more precise sketch of your graph. So these are the answers I got when I plugged in 0 and 2. And then again, I went to Desmos and I typed it in to see if I was doing pretty well. And this is the graph you should have gotten. So you notice that, again, it's been cut into three pieces. There's a piece to the left of x equals negative 3's vertical asymptote. There's a piece in the middle. And again, it's trapped by those vertical asymptotes. Remember, 
at the vertical asymptotes, it's undefined if you plugged in those numbers. So it's kind of trapped and bounded by those. It can't cross them. And then there's a graph to the right of the last vertical asymptote, x equals 1. But notice that this graph does go below the horizontal asymptote, and then it starts coming back up and approaching it. So a rational function can cross a horizontal, but it will not cross a vertical asymptote. But if you do graph it, even though it crosses this piece to the right, even though it crosses below the horizontal asymptote, then it'll start coming back up and continuing to approach this horizontal asymptote. And again, if you want to verify that, plug in a really big number into this equation and see what you get. And you're going to get an answer that's really close to two. All right, so in this video, we talked about how to graph a rational function, including determining their horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Thanks for watching our guide on rational functions. And please read this video's description for further resources.